Welcome to the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. My name is Gabriella, and I serve as Director of Liturgy here. I'd like to give you all a warm welcome, and I have a few instructions before we begin our liturgy this evening. First of all, we ask that you uh, fill out that tracing card that you received, and if you can, write the number that is in front of you, or take a picture, the date and time of the Mass, and take that with you. Again, six feet distance, maintaining that. And for communion, we will be receiving the host in the hand only. When it's before communion, we will all say amen together, collectively. That way, when you approach the priest, you'll come in silence. Please extend your hand out. The priest will place the host in your hand, and then you'll proceed to a yellow X on the floor. At that point, you can take your mask off and consume the host. Put the mask back on and then go back to your pew. And again, we do ask if you would please follow the directions of the ushers. Thank you so much. Good evening, and welcome to the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels and to our annual Requiem Mass for the Unborn. Today we have a much smaller group than the thousands who usually congregate in this church on this day. But we welcome you to this annual remembrance of those who have perished through abortion and those who have been harmed through abortion and our entire community who lives in this way. Like so many things this year, this Mass and One Life LA that preceded it today are very different. And we miss greeting the friends that sometimes we see just once a year here and the, those others that we work shoulder to shoulder with all year long as we work to build a culture of life here in Los Angeles. And so I thank you all for joining us in prayer this evening. Though this evening's Mass is solemn, we bring the celebration of the joy of life with us that we celebrated earlier today into our prayer now, realizing that it is because life is a gift and life is a joy that when young life is ended abruptly, there is such great sadness. I'd like to thank you all for your continued efforts to end abortion 
to assist women and children and families, to support the ill and the elderly and the disabled. Your works of mercy bring to life our commitment here. Our prayers and our work join to build a true culture of life in our community. Let us now begin our Requiem Mass for the unborn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters, peace be with you. Amen. Welcome to our Cathedral of Our Lady the Angels for our celebration of uh, the Mass uh, for the breaking uh, for the unborn. Today we celebrate, celebrate the Mass for giving thanks to God for the gift of human life. And uh, we especially continue to pray for everybody who is suffering as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic and especially for the culture of life, for the joy of life. So let's start our celebration acknowledging our sins and preparing ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, God and to you, my brothers and sisters, and sisters that, that I have, have greatly sinned, sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in, in what, what I have done, done and in what I have failed to do, through, through my fault, fault through, through my fault, fault through my, my most grievous fault, fault. Therefore, Therefore, I ask, ask blessed, blessed Mary, Mary ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and, and you, my brothers, my brothers and sisters, to, to pray, pray for me to the Lord our God. God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Thank you. 
Let us pray. God, our Creator, we give thanks to you, who alone have the power to impart the breath of life, that you form each of us in our mother's womb. Grant, we pray, that we, whom you have made stewards of creation, may remain faithful to this sacred trust, and constantly safeguarding the dignity of every human life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A re reading from the book of the prophet Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, saying, Set out for the great city of Nineveh and announce to it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah made ready and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's bidding. Now Nineveh was an enormously large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began his journey through the city and had gone but a single day's walk announcing 40 days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. When the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and all of them, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw by their actions how they turned from their evil ways, he repented of the evil that he had threatened to do to them. He did not carry it out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I tell you, brothers and sisters, the time is running out. From now on, let those having wives act as not having them, those weeping as not weeping, those rejoicing as not rejoicing, those buying as not owning, those using the world as not using it fully. For the world in its present form is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to Glory you, O Lord. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they abandoned their nets and followed him. He walked along a little farther and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They too were in a boat, mending their nets. Then he called them. So they left their father Zebedee in the boat, along with the hired men, and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, I first want to offer a word of gratitude to Archbishop Gomez, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to preach tonight, but more importantly, for his leadership, both here in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and in the Church of the United States, especially Archbishop in regard to the pro-life cause. Secondly, I want to thank all of you who have labored for years in the vineyard of the Lord, striving to protect life at all stages. May God bless you and continue to give you strength and courage. Friends, why do we fight for life? We do so because we're Americans and because we're Catholics. As Catholics, we know that God is a God of life. The opening verses of the book of Genesis tell us that the Lord created life in all of its marvelous abundance and diversity and gave to human life a unique dignity. Furthermore, practically every book of the Old Testament confirms that God sealed his covenants with the human race with the injunction, be fruitful and multiply. We know from the prophet Jeremiah that even unborn human life is sacred. For the Lord said to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. Friends, as Catholics, we also know that the lives of the sick and the elderly matter. For the book of Proverbs tells us, Do not despise your mother when she is old. And the book of Sirach says, my child, help your father in his old age. Do not grieve him as long as he lives. We know furthermore that the lives of the poor and the forgotten matter for the prophet Isaiah, channeling the voice of the Lord, declares, Is this not the fast that I choose? To let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. The same themes are sounded in the New Testament as well. In the 10th chapter of St. John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus himself says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. This includes the life of the unborn, for in the story of the visitation we learn, upon hearing the voice of Mary, John the Baptist leapt for joy in his mother's womb. And most importantly, at the very center of the church's evangelical proclamation is that the crucified Jesus has been, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised to life. So our God is definitively and defiantly a God of life. But as I said... We're also defenders of life because we're Americans. The great values that undergird our unique political experiment in ordered liberty are ones with which biblical people find a deep resonance. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Friends, since our equality comes from being created, we don't think that the unborn or the elderly or the sick are any less equal than the rest of the population. And since the rights we have are inalienable, they obtain in regard to the weakest and most vulnerable in our society. And what precisely are these rights? Well, Mr. Jefferson told us, life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Since they come not from the state but from God, these privileges inhere in everyone. So who are we ever to say to an unborn child, you have forfeited your right to life? Or to a sick and elderly person, your freedom can be abrogated. Or to someone on society's fringes, we are indifferent to your pursuit of happiness. As Americans, we stand against these assaults on human rights. And both as Americans and as Catholics, our concern for life ought to be wide 
and deep. Here's Pope Francis. I'm quoting now. Sacred are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned and underprivileged, the vulnerable, infirm, and elderly exposed to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking, new forms of slavery, every form of rejection. Close quote. Therefore, anyone victimized, anyone alone and afraid, anyone under political oppression, anyone enduring race prejudice, anyone treated with disrespect because of her religion, anyone whose health is in danger because he can't find sufficient food or clean water, comes legitimately under our care. Nevertheless, the church recognizes the need to prioritize among the life issues. Raising its voice with particular insistence when human life is directly threatened. This is why euthanasia, capital punishment, and abortion are of paramount concern. And of those three, the issue of abortion remains, as the Bishop of the United States have put it, preeminent due to the sheer number of lives that it destroys. Did you know that each year between 2015 and 2019 worldwide, 73 million induced abortions occurred. Did you know that in those years, three out of every 10 pregnancies ended in abortion? In our country alone, more than 800,000 abortions took place last year. And since the passing of Roe v. Wade in 1973, in excess of 61 million abortions have occurred in the United States. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not a minor problem. In fact, there is no more brutal attack on human life than this. Listen again to Pope Francis. I'm quoting him. Among the vulnerable for whom the church wishes to care with particular love and concern are unborn children, the most defenseless and innocent among us. And taking on the culturally trendy defenders of the pro-choice position, Pope Francis asserts, I'm quoting again, I want to be completely honest in this regard. This is not something subject to alleged reforms or modernizations. It is not progressive to try to resolve problems by eliminating a human life. Close quote. And even more bluntly, I'm quoting again from Pope Francis, it is not right to do away with a human being, however small, in order to solve a problem. It's like hiring a hitman to solve a problem. Close quote. Now, friends, where does this indifference to life come from? It comes from sinful human hearts, to be sure, but also from what St. John Paul II called the culture of death and what Pope Francis has memorably called the throwaway culture. What is needed, therefore, at both the personal and societal level is repentance. Listen now to Jesus from our gospel for this evening. It's his inaugural address, the first words we hear from him in the gospel of Mark. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is everything that stands athwart the culture of death and the throwaway culture. It is the state of affairs that obtains when God is allowed to reign over every aspect of life. To enter into it, one must undergo conversion, metanoia in the original Greek, which has the sense of going beyond the mind you have, seeing in a fresh way. St. Augustine's expression for the throwaway culture and the culture of death is the civitas terrena, the earthly city by which he means a community centered on self-love. Conversion for the great Augustine 
is all about moving from that earthly city to what he called the city of God. That community predicated not upon love of self, but radical love of God. In that city, everybody, filled with converted people, the culture of life holds sway. In that city, no one is left behind. In that city, no one is thrown away. So, we're all summoned to a constant and ever deeper repentance, becoming ever more fully citizens of the city of God. But then we have the call to bring the wider world to conversion. Our incomparably rich first reading tells us of the prophet Jonah, who'd been ordered by God to preach to the city of Nineveh, the capital of an empire deeply inimical to Israel. Of course, Jonah balked. Told to go east by land, he went west by sea, trying to get as far away from the voice of God as possible. But the Lord sent the great fish that swallowed up the reluctant prophet and brought him right back to where God wanted him. And once he undertook his task, he became the greatest prophet of repentance in history. Everyone in pagan Nineveh, from the most ordinary citizen to the king himself, put on sackcloth. Heck, even the animals, we are told, repented. Well, listen. We are all Jonah's. God wants us preaching to Nineveh, to our increasingly secularized society, to our throwaway culture. And friends, it's just as daunting now as it was then. I, I know, like the ancient prophet, we are tempted to run away from the task. Given the attitudes and prejudices of our society, we feel it's just too much. But if we surrender to God, mighty forces will come to our aid. There's no limit to what the Lord might accomplish through our witness. So we preach to be sure with our words, through publications, through the internet, through conversation with friends and enemies, by marching and raising our voices in public protest. But we preach most powerfully through our actions. Many years ago, Cardinal John O'Connor of New York said that as a concrete expression of a pro-life commitment, every parish in his archdiocese ought to be willing to care for a pregnant woman and her baby no matter what, under any circumstances. Well, Cardinal O'Connor's successor, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, related a story from just a few years ago. At Christmas time, a young mother, a recent Mexican immigrant, gave birth to a child out of wedlock. She had no money, she had no decent place to stay, no means of caring for her child. So she went to her local parish where she had felt welcomed and she placed her newborn baby in the crib in the nativity scene. Soon enough, good people from the parish heard the child's cries and found a way to care for him. That's a story of the city of God. That's how converted people behave. That's the opposite of the throwaway culture. And so, my fellow Americans, my fellow Catholics, we fight for life. We gladly accept the daunting mission that God has given to us to go into Nineveh and preach repentance in season and out. When they love us for it, when they hate us for it, despite mockery and discouragement, when the political winds are blowing with us and when they're blowing against us. We fight for life, for there's no limit to what God can accomplish through us when we surrender to His will and purpose.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father, Father before, before all, all ages, ages. God and God, God, life, life and life, true, true God and true God, God. begotten, non made, made consubstantial with the Father. Father. Through, Through him all things, things were made. made. For, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And, and by the Holy Spirit, Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius, Pontius Pilate. Pilate. He, he suffered, suffered death, death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, just living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of life. Confident in God's love for us as the creator, redeemer, and lord of our lives, we bring our prayers of petition before his altar. For the legal protection of unborn children and for loving support for their mothers before and after their births, we pray to the Lord. For our public servants, May God grant them the humility, wisdom, and courage to defend all human life from conception to natural death. We pray to the Lord. For women and men suffering after abortion, may they deeply experience the Lord's loving mercy and healing, we pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. For friends and families of women with difficult pregnancies, may they provide loving, life-affirming support for both mother and child. We pray to the Lord. For our nation, may God unite us in peace and respect for each other and strengthen our resolve to uphold the dignity of every human life. We pray to the Lord. For those intentions we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. God, our loving Father, grant wisdom to those who lead us, 
compassion and courage to those who work to defend human life, and safety and care to every human being. For you alone who form us in our mother's wombs and who call us home to heaven, our God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. Accept our humble offerings, O Lord of the living. I unite us to the perfect sacrifice of your Son, through whom you have made all creation new, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is right and just, our dear and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For we know it belongs to your boundless glory, that you came to the aid of mortal being with, you, with your divinity, and even fashioned for us a remedy out of mortality itself, that the cause of our downfall might become the means of our salvation through Christ our Lord. Through him, the host of angels adore your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. In our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exalt and praise as we acclaim.
You are in the Holy Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give light to all things and made them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit graciously made holy these gifts, have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wonderful resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you intensively this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, and that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant Francis, our Pope, Jose, our Archbishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
A disciples command and form find by teaching with their to say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, though we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, and by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who say to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Amen. Once again, we ask that you would please follow the instructions of the ushers. Please approach the priest giving communion in silence. Stretch out your hand. We will be giving communion out to the hand only. Once you receive the communion, please go to the yellow X on the floor, take the mask off, consume the Eucharist, and then put the mask on and go back to your pew. If you are not receiving communion today, we do ask that you come forward anyway so that you don't have to cross over other people as you go into the center aisle. And again, please maintain social distancing. Thank you.
Let us pray. Increase your love within us, Lord God, by the seven mysteries we have celebrated, and bring people everywhere to respect your gift of human life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. By the grace of God, I'm Deacon Charlie Echeverry, and I am president of SOFISA, a mission-based nonprofit here in Los Angeles that's dedicated to creating relationship and community with homeless and displaced families. Exactly a year ago, here at One Life, in fact, in this very requiem mass, my wife, Jessica, shared her incredible personal testimony of trauma, homelessness, and abortion, and the miraculous healing which our Lord has brought about in her life and through her witness, the lives of so many others, leading, as often paradoxically does in the order of grace, to the flourishing of a number of ministries in which she and I are involved, including, of course, Sophisa. Our relationship with these families over the last 20 years has taught me many things. But one in particular which has deep significance for me is this, an abounding and extraordinary strength and dignity that is found in mothers. Mothers. Mothers like the young pregnant woman from Nigeria we encountered, abandoned by her husband, with two small children in the world and a third in her womb, homeless, afraid, in desperation, seeking out a planned parenthood, but lovingly counseled by a Catholic woman praying outside the clinic that eventually led her to us. And now a few years later, that woman is part of my family. And her courage, her love for God, and her faith have provided for me personally some of the greatest spiritual instruction I've ever received. Mothers like the one we encountered years ago who raised her two daughters in her car, who parked the car near the girls' school in order that they always be on time, in order that they acquire an education, and in order that they not have to repeat that same road of trauma and injury and despair that she had. Mothers like these are the light by which I offer to you this very brief reflection inspired by this Requiem Mass. You know, it's not lost on me the significance of the beautiful tapestry of Our Lady that's hanging here behind me as I give this particular reflection. It's certainly more beautiful in person than it was online when I first saw it. And that significance isn't lost on me because, of course, she is a mother. Our Lady is our mother, is Jesus' mother, is the mother of God. But also because her identity, her name, her title is hidden in plain sight in all the references around the world that are made about the city that we live in. How few people recognize that when they say L.A., they're really addressing a person and a mother. Nuestra Señora, la Reina de los Ángeles, Our Lady, Queen of the Angels. And brothers and sisters, there is another reality hidden in plain sight within the issue of abortion. One which is involved in every case, no matter where it happens, no matter the stage of the pregnancy or its circumstances, in all cases, whether an abortion is committed or only considered, and that is the reality that in abortion, there is always the heart of a mother at stake. A mother often traumatized like my wife was. A mother often unsupported 
misunderstood or convinced of a seemingly insurmountable number of obstacles, a mother in many cases who feels unable to even give voice to her concerns because she may live and work inside of a secular culture that can chastise and shun those who so much as hint at the idea that abortion is anything other than some kind of empowerment. How often we forget that reality. The reality of the heart of those mothers when we battle the injustice of abortion. That mother, that mother is my wife. And millions upon millions of other women. Those who've experienced abortion and those who've considered it. Just as the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of her Son were uniquely united during her pregnancy, so too are the hearts of millions of mothers united in a special way with their children, especially when those children are in the womb. And that's one reason why abortion so deeply wounds mothers and why we must work tirelessly to support, pray for, and love every mother, in every circumstance, especially those millions of mothers who have been impacted by the reality of abortion. You know, so many million women sit in pews in our churches, in parishes and chapels throughout the country, and they carry an unsettling feeling. They carry a sorrow, a regret, a certain kind of shame. A sorrow which rarely finds even the voice of expression for fear of condemnation, for fear of misunderstanding, judgment, or reprisal. But those very women sitting in those pews are the allies we so desperately need in the fight for life. They can become the lifeblood of this entire movement to authentically speak to the dignity of life and the false choice of abortion. They're incredible witnesses, like my wife Jessica, powerful witnesses of the transformative power of the gospel and the best evidence that I know of the dignity of human life. But many, so many of them remain silent, uninvited, unwelcomed to this march for life. I offer to those women at this moment right now who may hear my voice this small word of encouragement. We need you. God loves you. And your child prays for you at this very moment to answer this call. You are invited. You are needed. You are wanted. The world needs you to bear your cross as only mothers can, with strength and poise and dignity, and that you add your voices to ours. Because the cause of life cannot succeed without you. Thank you. unborn, alive within. Poised to enter the world, they had just begun their journeys. Their lives had purpose and meaning. They just needed more time. This evening, we will honor those lives lost to abortion today in Southern California. We will light the beautiful candles you see placed before the cathedral altar, and we will observe a period of silence for our sisters and brothers who needed more time. As you gaze at these flickering lights, think of each candle as representing one life lost to abortion this very day in Los Angeles. At sunrise, these lives had begun At its setting, these candles mark their passing from this world. 
even in their brevity, these lives had meaning and speak loudly of the injustice of a finish where there should have been a start, an ending which came at the beginning, a sunset at dawn. Rest in peace, little ones. May their souls and their souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.
My friends, our candles have been lit and prayerfully silence has been observed for these little ones who have gone home to the kingdom. Following our Mass, these candles will be placed in the windows of the cathedral colonnade where they will remain lit for a week and visible to the thousands of people traveling on the freeway below. As it says in the Gospel of Matthew, you are a light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. We pray that these flickering lights will serve as a shining witness to the city of the angels of our commitment to the sanctity of all human life. And as pastor of the cathedral, I extend a special thank you to those who during the past week made a donation to help support our ceremony of light this evening. I also thank each and every one of you here present, joining us for this very solemn and special celebration of the Eucharist. Those who are joining us via live stream, a special thank you to our choir and to all the other ministers of the liturgy this evening and those who spent time preparing. Thank you and may God bless you. So let us uh, keep keep uh, praying and working for the cultural life in uh, in, uh, in our country and in the world. And as Bishop Barron was reminding us, that's something that really belongs to us as Catholics and Americans. So. Uh, we pray for unity in our country and uh, especially for the uh, cultural life. Uh, we got beautiful testimonies today and uh, uh, it is a moment for us to especially continue to pray for the uh, ending of abortion in our country and in the world. Um, so hopefully next year we can have uh, uh, one life LA as we usually do. So let's pray for that because it helps us to really uh, make clear and help people to understand the beauty of life, as it was the theme of this year. You all are in my prayers, and thank you for joining us today. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May Almighty God bless you in his kindness and pour out saving wisdom upon you. Amen. Amen. He nourish you always with the teachings of the faith and make you persevere in holy deeds. Amen. Amen. May he turn your steps toward himself and show you the path of charity and peace. Amen. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
thank you so much for being with us this evening. Please remain in your place until you are escorted and directed by the ushers to exit the cathedral. Thank you very much. <laughs>